Welcome to the Synchronet version 3.1a new feature and installation demonstration. A little bit about the version number. The full version number is 3.18b. The B does not stand for beta. Uh, a little history on Synchronet versioning. Uh, when I first started out this project 30 years ago, uh, my sort of friend and mentor was Steve Deppy. And uh, he told me that when he was a CompuCore, he versioned his software uh, like 1A, 1B, 1C, etc. until he got to like a major change and then you would go to like 2A, 2B, 2C. I contemplated that and I thought, well, that's kind of good if, you know, it always takes up two digits for the version, but it's really not enough. I expect to do a lot more releases. And I, you know, I'd run out of letters pretty quickly. Uh, and then, you know, I'd end up with, I don't know, version 9Z someday and nowhere to go. I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll give a little bit more to that. I'll give like two digits pass. I'll like be one. My first synchronous version was like 1A00. I think the first public release, like 1A02 or something. Through version one, it was always one, a letter, like I think it went up to 1C something. Um, and when I went to synchronous version two, I thought, you know, that's really unusual versioning. It, it's not consistent with anything. So I, I switched to a little bit more traditional two point two digits and, the, and then I thought well I still want a letter um, to kind of indicate more minor revs and I didn't want to do another dot I didn't really like the two dots in a version number so that's how I ended up with like the 2.30a or whatever 2.00 a b c etc and now here we are 3.18 um, the 3.18 that's been in revision control systems uh, was CVS recently switched to Git. Uh, so open source available to anybody if they want to download plus with nightly builds, etc. That version was called 3.18a, uh, not officially released or anything, and it was constantly changing. I just recently changed it to B. This will be B, and then I'll quickly change the, re the revision in, uh, in Git to, to C. Uh, so that way, if somebody says they're, they're running version 3.18c, I know it's after the release. Uh, and then if I had to make another release of 3.18, that would probably be like D, you know, or E or something. Uh, anyhow, it just gives me uh, more visibility into the exact time that the, the software was cut at, uh, for the build that somebody is running and potentially asking a question about or reporting a problem with. This is demonstrating a fresh install. Uh, if you already have Synchronet installed, um, there'll be an update package for Windows. Um, if you're running on Linux or FreeBSD, um, you really don't want to follow these instructions anyway. You're probably going to be updating via Git, and there's different instructions for that on the, on the wiki, wiki.synchro.net. I'm using Windows 10 here. Uh, and if you already had Synchronet installed, um, I don't recommend using the installer unless you like have no user data and no customizations anything you care about losing in which case fine you can blow away your install but uh, when you so let's say you already had Synchronet installed and you wanted to, to remove it um, you can go to you know Windows add remove programs this is you know the correct way to do it uh, you know scroll down to s hmm, lots of programs installed on this system Find Synchronet. In this case, I'm, I've actually had the 3.18 installed, but uh, there'll be another version. Now, it doesn't fully get uninstalled, unfortunately. If you have any files that were created during the install, there's going to be some directories and some files in there. Uh, it's not a whole lot of data, but it is remnants. It could have users and such. So to fully remove that, you want to do, you know, go ahead and remove, remove the directory tree. And then additionally, in your registry, so if you run regedit, you can run it like that. Um, if you find synchronous control panel, it actually appear in a couple places in uh, the registry, but they're, they're like links to each other. So if you delete one, you delete both. Anyhow, you want to find this uh, Swindell synchronous control panel and remove that. Otherwise, you'll still have settings from your previous install if you care. We remove that and then you get what would be a actual fresh install. So it's a setup program. Uh, so it's warning you it's going to install Synchronet BBS software. Oh my god, on your computer. Uh, there's not a whole lot of change here. The system requirements are much the same. I think it'll still work on XP, although I haven't tried it. I don't know of any reason why I wouldn't. It's possible it doesn't. So let me know. Um, I can test it on Windows 7 and I will before I actually make the release. 
this is not an upgrade. So if you want, if you are upgrading, there's a separate zip you want to um, uh, extract and read the, the README in there. And uh, tells you about the install directory. It recommends um, the root um, SBBS. If um, if you're not going to put it there, then use a, a DOS compatible file name is recommended. So the default C colon backslash SBBS for this demo that'll work fine. Now you ha do have a bunch of options here, uh, creating a desktop icon or not, startup I startup folder, so it'll run automatically when the machine boots, or at least when this user log is, logs in. Uh, if you do want it to start without a user logged in, you'd want to install it as a service, and that's what this option here is for, the NT service. If you're going to use dial-up support, you'll want the POTS program, it's called SexPOTS, and that's what that option enables. Um, by default, all the servers are enabled, and all the services like Finger, Gopher, etc. Uh, now there is an option here for the web interface, and the default now has changed. Uh, so previously we were installing this legacy slash rune master web interface. Uh, it's not really supported any longer, that's why I'm calling it legacy. We do occasionally make a bug fix or two, but no major features. And so you're not going to really see a lot of improvements there. The uh, executive chicken is making a lot of updates to his web interface. He's on version 4 now, and that's what is now installed by default. It actually installs both of them, but which one is active at a time uh, is what this radio button allows you to choose. And it's easy to switch between them, so don't worry too much about which decision you make here. It's just one line in an INI file to switch back and forth. And to give you a little preview, so this is the chicken's uh, web interface. That's his board. There's, you know, menus. I think those are tests there. So he's got, you know, forums. Uh, they look a lot more like a web forum. Up, up and down voting and stuff, and uh, I think he's got you know, game interfaces and a file menu. So this is the EC web or eChicken web interface. If you want to see what the legacy interface looks like, it's more like this, like message groups. So kind of comparable, going to like DoveNet. And I do also have EC web running on my board. Again, forums and files, and there's a games menu, I think, once you're logged in. All right, so it gives you an idea what, what which web interface you might want to choose here. And it's just telling you all your install options. You get it installed. I think it takes about 70 megabytes installed. Maybe it's 80. I don't know. It's a crazy number compared to the old days with floppy disks and 64 kilobytes of RAM. But in today's day and age, it's no big deal. All right, by default, it launches Synchronet right after you install it. So I'll go ahead and leave that checkbox checked. You get to look at the splash screen for two and a half seconds, and then you get the configuration wizard. No changes here, really. This is the same old wizard. Now, I did notice on one system I was testing this, that if you canceled or exited, if completed the wizard, uh, this control panel would actually crash sometimes. I'd never seen that before, and if it happens to you, just rerunning the BBS again will work, just rerunning the synchronous control panel. But, uh, I did change the startup of this program and the, the configuration wizard seemed to fix that issue, although I didn't actually come to the root cause of it. So when you go through the install wizard, um, and you could bypass this and set these same settings in the configuration program, but this is a little bit more modern um, way to prompt you for each important setting. So your location, I'm in Norco, California. And you know, you probably want to name your BBS something cool like my cool BBS your name for your, your system operator. So you can just give me an alias or a name. And then your system password. And this is going to be important. You're going to be asked again later. You're going to need this pretty much any time you do any sysop activities uh, that could be potentially done remotely. You're going to need that password. Confirming your, your time zone and how you want uh, times and dates displayed. Your host name. If you have multiple host names, you can pick it, or you can just type it in here. All right, now you need to set your QWK ID, and it's limited to eight characters because DOS. So that's probably not a good one. I want to shorten that to cool BBS. And it's got to have legal DOS file name characters, and it's got to start with an alpha character. And uh, you got a QWK tagline. This one will be fine, but you could change it if you want. Uh, settings here, number of nodes you're going to run, um, how many FTP users and mail users and web users, etc. And um, by default, all the nodes are available via Telnet. Probably want to leave that checked. 
And then uh, here's some t important toggle options. You can always change these later, either with the wizard or with the standard configuration program called a CFG. An important one here is require new user feedback. So a lot of people ask how to turn that off because they don't want their new users to have to send them an email when they, when they log in. So you can just turn that off right here. Uh, another one is whether or not you can see deleted messages. If this is set to yes, that often confuses people. Why can I see deleted messages? I delete a message, it doesn't go away. So setting that to no resolves that frequently asked question. Um, the reason is because so you can undelete it and until it's actually physically purged from the database, you can still undelete it. But if you want only you, the sysop, to be able to see deleted messages, then you can set that to sysops only. Like, that's how I usually have mine set. But um, if it confuses you to see a message after it's been deleted, then go ahead and set it to no. Again, you're going to be asked here for your the past system password that you set earlier, or whatever that was. And then you're done. One change you'll notice here is uh, it defaults to what I'm calling dark mode. Dark mode seems to be all the rage. It looks kind of more retro. Uh, you know, light colors on a black background. If you don't like this, if you want the, the older style, it's pretty easy to get that. Just say import settings up here, file, import settings and then choose uh, SPVS control light mode and voila you're back to the old default for 3.7 and every version I don't know 3.1 and later I think use the, this kind of color scheme and if for some reason you want to go back to dark mode choose that import option and voila you're back to dark mode and if you want to customize this further like you you want to change the colors or make these bold or something uh, you go File, Properties, Customize. This is not a new feature. It's been there. Um, you check, check first select uh, a good one. A, uh, a dialog is kind of set how you like it. So like the terminal server. And then I just say, I just want to make this a bold font. So I'm just going to choose bold. And then, hit, oh, oh, and then hit Apply Scheme to Terminal Server. There we go. Now see how that turned bold? And if I wanted it to be like yellow or something, I could change the color here and then apply it there. And if I want to apply it everywhere, I can choose this all windows here option and then apply and then it changes everywhere. And it's automatically saving those changes. I don't, I could hit okay or cancel. Uh, and you can get more fancy, you can use italics and stuff and change what font um, and obviously the colors involved there. And then um, the colors, so one thing I don't like about mixing bold and non-bold here as you see that they don't quite line up um, this text here would normally um, these timestamps would line up in the date and they're not um, and that I don't know doesn't agree with my sensibilities so if I was going to keep these bold here this the normal text uh, these these log messages here are the normal or informal informational log messages um, then I would probably uh, bold the errors as well, or the warnings, you know, these other uh, log, like those are warnings, I believe, or maybe it's just notice, yeah. So like here, it's uh, it's regular, I would also set that to bold, and then hit OK. Alright, so some other new options here is file run, and then you have some default scripts, so there's an update script uh, that is handy when you're updating uh, from a development build, like just some files that came from Git or you downloaded a, a zip file um, from Vertrauen. And uh, a lot of times you want to run an update script after that, and that's usually invoked with JS exec. So it's just JS exec update from a command line. Um, this does the same thing. So if I just run that, it's, uh, it's not actually going to do anything, but recompile the Baja modules and stuff. And you have a check setup script here. We'll kind of do a sanity check. Um, and guess what? We have no users, so there's going to be an error there. <laughs> Let me see what else we got. Installing FidoNet. A lot of these things aren't going to work right until you have a user set up, so probably you want to avoid uh, using these until you actually create a user first. Let's go ahead and do that.
All right, so Melogan is new, first time, and if you are the for only user, the first user, then you're going to have to retype that system password you put in. And now, this is a newer prompt um, where it's asking you to hit the backspace or delete key. And the reason for this is twofold. One, um, some terminals send the delete sequence for backspace, so that's what ASCII 127 um, instead of uh, control h ascii 8 uh, and that can be a problem for some users and the other thing is that petsky terminals a uh, commodore uh, they send i think a control t for backspace so this kind of lets you also detect a petsky terminal and also correctly set it for um, other terminals so in this case i'm using sync term it's going to send uh, the normal backspace character which is eight so mouse reporting, that's a new feature. Um, I'll go ahead and turn that on. And yes, IBM extended ASCII. Yes, it's correct. This is just about the synchronous version. Not really much has changed here on these new screens. Uh, the command shell. Now, if you haven't installed 317, then this might be new to you, but here you can choose what avatar you want associated with your user account. There's lots of different categories and avatars here. Uh, I'm just using a silhouette as a default. I'm going to pick what, uh, an alien, I guess. Uh, just some regular bulletins. I don't think they've been uh, changed in a long time. Now, uh, this is asking if you want to create a guest account. It's important that you do, otherwise, like the eChicken web interface doesn't work. Um, if you don't want a guest account, that's fine, but just know that like anonymous FTP and the um, web interface might have problems. So, uh, I highly recommend that you do create a guest account. Uh, no need to search messages. I know there aren't any. Okay, so I did have another video I was demonstrating mouse support, but. You can see with using sync term or another terminal that has mouse reporting, um, you can actually use the mouse. And uh, some of the newest, coolest things here, um, you're going to find under external programs and by default now, not too many installed by default. So you got the bullseye bulletins we saw during the logon. There's this synchronous BBS list. If it's empty it by default, and it's going to ask you if you want to add your BBS. So avatar chooser we already saw under games. There's only one game here, and that's synchronous Minesweeper. It's a new one. Um, you've probably seen that as well on another video. It also supports mouse operations. Boom. But under operator, this is a new default external program section. And you have uh, the synchronic configuration program that you can run remotely. Uh, and this is nice if you run your um, BBS on a, uh, like a rented server or some kind of remote access and you want to make configuration changes, then you can. It looks very similar to what it does locally. And if for some reason the ANSI uh, version doesn't work too well, you can also run it in dumb terminal mode and you get all the same options, just a lot more keyboard intensive and then there's that check setup script I tried to show earlier now it's going to run better um, it's warning me hey your BBS isn't listed in the official or in even on your own BBS list can't send inner BBS messages so you got two issues here uh, FidoNet configuration I'll get to so um, if you're setting up FidoNet first time run this and you can choose which which FidoNet network you want to install or initialize um, and um, feel like you're doing FidoNet uh, zone one, you put in your hub, don't do this address, this is me, and uh, this would be a temporary node number ending in 9999, got a whole nother video on that, passwords, do I want to send a node number application to Nick Andre, uh, no, add that node to my configuration, yes, that is my origin line, sure, and I'm going to create, so this will create a FidoNet group in the configuration, just quickly taking a break away from this and running the configuration uh, message areas. 
So you see I have local and DevNet by default, so no FidoNet. But if I say yes here, uh, it just uh, it's going to add the group and save changes. Yeah, I want to save the changes. Now it's asking me if I want to download the echo list. So this is going to be all the current echoes on the FidoNet backbone, zone one. Yeah. Ask me if I want to download it from that location. If you want to change the location, you say no, and then you can put it in a different place. It's downloading. Now I can import it. Runs an import program. And I save the changes. Uh, it's asking me, asking me to confirm the location where I want uh, incoming mail files to come. Packets and bundles and other files. Secure, and then, yeah, outbound is sure. Ask me if I want to route route the netmail. Sure. Install Binkit. Binkit is the FidoNet mailer written in JavaScript for Synchronet by Deuce. So yeah. And then ask me if I want to send a node number application to because I said no earlier. Now I can send one via netmail if I want. I'll say no, I don't need to do that. And not to the other one. And uh, this is interesting. So there's a text file section or operator. And by default, it's blank. I can add text files there, links, basically. And I can add the import ac uh, export activity log. That's cool. Um, so bad area list, that's what this is. The received, uh, unrecognized received echo mails. Yeah, sure. It's basically say yes to all these options. And so now, if I go back to the config program, and I look under message areas, there's FidoNet there, and it's got 200 subboards. Magically. And... These settings are all set nice for default, so you got a internal code prefix. If you look at all the subs, these are all imported dynamically from the web, and uh, all your settings are set sensibly. Um, if you wanted to, like, say, increase the maximum messages, uh, the best way to do that would be, like, set this to a bigger number. Go to toggle options, and say template for new sub, yes. And then you can go here and say clone options. Yeah, and now all the subs will have 5,000 as their default. And you can do that for the other options um, basically everywhere here, from here down, as far as access requirements, um, duplicate checking, you know, purging old messages, etc. Now, I'm still logged into the BBS over here. And that means that if I list the message groups, it's not going to show up yet. I have to log off. And then the, uh, the BBS will recycle. See it there, just recycled. And then I log back in. Now if I don't, it shows up, all the subboards there. They're empty. I haven't downloaded any packets or anything yet. So that's new. Very quick and easy to join FidoNet. So you can also run the FidoNet configuration program called Echo Config. You can run that from here, either with an ANSI interface or the dumb terminal interface. This is the ANSI interface, so um, so because I went through that setup, I have now have uh, my hub, which was me, uh, here. After I installed those FidoNet options, um, I got an operator menu under the text section that has some, some options. And these are basically log files or um, statistics files, and they're going to be empty right now because I haven't run anything. So now, because I went through the FidoNet setup, I have a FidoNet menu. And this uh, is an easy way to, to launch Echo Config and um, force a poll. That'll just run the uh, Bink poll event. And you can view um, various log and statistics files from here. And if you want to hand edit your SPBS Echo INI, you can do that, uh, or your area file. So I don't actually have an area file yet. I think if I force it, force SPBS Echo to run once, it'll create an area file. Do like. Fido out, for example. Now if I look at that area file, there we go. So it will automatically add to the area file miss areas that are missing that first time that uh, you run SBBS Echo. And uh, this is the internal code of the message base on your system, the FidoNet uh, title of that Echo, and then the list of uh, addresses that are connected through your system. So this is normally your uplink followed by any downlinks you have, and they're just space separated FidoNet addresses. And like you can look at your log here. So you see that it added all the areas. 
All right, so this last option is cool. Automatically installing a bunch of external programs that come with Synchronet. So they're actually physically there. They're just in, in the directory. So you have all these directories and all the program files are in there, uh, basically waiting for you to get them in your setup. But rather than preset them up for you, I decided to just make it very easy for you to set them up. And also that would make it easy to set up new games that are released. Um, you can just extract them in that directory and then set them up through this kind of interface. Or, you know, like using this one where you go file, run, install external programs. This one is going to be similar. It gives you the list here and you can pick uh, which directory you want to install. Um, this doesn't scroll, so like, let's see if we make this bigger. And then I'll rerun that. Yeah, now I can at least scroll back, or just go like that. So now at least I can see them all. So there's 32. All right, so let's start with ANSI view here. This is another script from the executive chicken. Uh, it's asked, confirms that you want to install that, yeah. And it'll pick a section sort of based on the category names here if there's a match. If you want to pick a different category, just say no, and then you can choose another category. But I do really do want it in main, so I'll say yeah. Now it's asking if you want to share data with the uh, electronic chicken BBS. So this is cool. You want to do this probably. And you'll, you'll benefit from getting um, access to like his uh, ANSI library. Pretty cool. More games and um, categories, you know, just descriptions there. When you have the option to share the data, go ahead and try that first. Pretty cool when you can see the scores from other BBSs and stuff. Uh, domain poker is an older native program. Most of these are in JavaScript. Uh, Gopher is not a game, it's a Gopher client. Google Google, Jeopardy game. Uh, Solomon's War it actually has, this installs the Earth, I think. Yeah, it only installs the Earth map, and there's actually, I think, four more. So if you like this game, look for the other maps and how to install those. And yes, there's Legend of the Red Dragon and Lord 2. This one's interesting because it's got a lot of options when you install. It's because it's got IGMs. So you say, yeah, you want to install in the game section. Yeah. Uh, so you have some other options. You can run a this configuration script. You can have available to the operator if you want. I'll go and say, yeah. And uh, there's a reset option to make it easy to reset the game too. I'll come up. Yep, that question. Uh, you also get the option to install these IGMs or inter-game modules. And these are the ones that come stock. Need to log out, have to in install new games, let the BBS recycle. There it goes, it's recycling. Only takes a second. Log right back in. And now you have the options, you know, the games that you added. So there's Legend of the Red Dragon. A new feature here is that it'll dynamically translate this to Petski or uh, UTF 8. So the reason I like making these videos is this is. Uh, when the bugs come out of their little hiding places and show up. So um, after a few more fresh installs here, some C and JavaScript changes, um, I'm happy now with the results. Now, if you have trouble reading this like I do, um, you want to go back to the light mode, like I showed earlier. Uh, you can just select that here with using the uh, file import settings. And you go back to the old, the old style. Um, but I wanted to read this error here to you. Uh, so SSH error couldn't import the session key used to protect the private key. That's because the default uh, system password is uh, syspass, and that's, I first ran this, I aborted the configuration wizard, it initialized the private key, it encrypted it with that default session password, syspass. Uh, then when I ran it again, the second time, uh, I went through the configuration wizard and I did set a system, system password, but it wasn't the same. It wasn't syspass. Uh, so that's why this error is coming up. Now, you get a similar warning if you go into configure system and uh, change your system password. It warns you, oh, you know, th this will require a new key and certificate. Yes. Test, test. Uh, the system password change, delete the crypt key and certificate? Yes. If you don't, then it's not going to be able to decrypt it. Unless you happen to be changing it to the system password that was used to encrypt it to begin with, which is possible. All right, so that's how you take care of that error. Uh, you might have noticed 
uh, when I was connecting earlier that the banner was changing. So we got that banner. If I hang up and call back, I got a uh, two-thirds chance it'll be different. There we go. Uh, and that's a new feature as well. Um, previously, you'd have to have like some script logic to like know how many different banners you want to display here and then generate a random number and pick. It's a lot easier now. Uh, so that's accomplished um, like this. So like looking at the answer.msg, it uses the menu add code and then it passes uh, dot dot slash banner star. And the star now is treated special. Uh, it'll automatically enumerate the files, you know, count how many files are that match that pattern and then pick one at random. So if you look at uh, SPDS text banner, there's three of them. So if I just created another one, a fourth one, uh, now we'll have a 25% chance of grabbing that banner. Let's see if we're lucky. Nope. There we go. So that's all you have to do to randomize menus now. Uh, and anything that calls the menu function doesn't have to actually be a menu. It could just be a display file, but it's of a set. And it'll if you include a wildcard like that. It'll pick uh, either a question mark or a star. It'll pick at random uh, one of any of the files that match that wildcard pattern. So some of the other new features uh, that you'll see, like if you go in the configuration program and you go under loadable modules, system loadable modules, you'll see there's a lot more options here and you should have them set up like this by default. Um, and if you want to revert in some cases to old behavior, you can either clear this out, clear one of these settings out, or you can install like an, another uh, third-party module there. The auto message now is all JavaScripted. The text section, so that's the general text file section um, that I was showing you earlier. Um, the external program section always has been, but uh, I think it was hard-coded before in the Baja and uh, JavaScript command shells to call that, so now it's configurable, easy to replace with another program section. This reading mail module option here has been here, but uh, I didn't have a default module set up, so now I do. So if you... Uh, have email. There's no mail right now, but if I send myself mail and then I read it, you'll see that this interface is quite different. So you get a, a list of all the messages and um, you can toggle the preview. That's what P is there. And then uh, if you select a message now, if it's a long message, you can scroll through it without erasing the, uh, the header there. So it's convenient for reading long messages and keeping track of who wrote it. Uh, and there's, you know, some other options here for um, changing the word wrapping and whether or not to look at, like, decoded HTML or raw HTML, that kind of thing. So it's really particularly handy for email, like internet email. Yeah, so that's new. Um, the uh, logon list module is totally replaced. Actually, there was no module before. It was all, all hard-coded. So now when you uh, do, like, UL, this is actually all JavaScript driven and uh, uses a JSON L file. That's a line delimited JSON for the list of callers. So it's easy to customize, display however you like, add more data, etc. cetera. Um, the reason why I don't show up here, so my login says no login, even though I had logged in. We go to toggle options, include sysop and statistics, set that to yes. And I'll log off. Let the board recycle. It's recycling. Back in. Now I show up in the logon list. Uh, but rather, previously this was like a text file with, with control A codes embedded in it. Uh, it was not something that was easily to programmatically parse or um, extend in any way. Uh, that's all changed. So now um, that data file is. Yeah, logons, logon.jsonl. So that's the actual data. The old list file is still maintained in the code, so you can still use that if you have a, if there's a module or something that's using it, but it doesn't support like the web login information, things that um, are now supported. For example, I log into localhost.
This is another reason to use the, uh, the electronic chicken web interface is you get the support. So now I uh, logged in on the web. I've got a web login here, you see, but it doesn't show up in the, the old legacy logon.list file. Uh, so that's a reason you'll want to make sure that you're using the new, the new logon list module. You get uh, web logins and then um, also replace or like intermess the uh, private messaging. So it's control P to bring that up. Um, if you want to send a message to, the, to a web logged in user, use telegram and then you can select their node. So that's node five. You should be able to send a message to the web interface. You can probably send it back so I can select myself here. Say hi from web. And I got a telegram, hi from the web. Enter BBS um, chat. It's right here, instant messaging from there. Um, so that's control U is uh, who's online active. Slash L does the node listing. This is all like the default command shell. Private messaging control P. So earlier I was showing, you know, how to auto install doors. These are really like JavaScript modules, but they look like doors to the user. In some cases, these are doors, like Domain Poker is a native program. Um, it's Synchronet specific, but uh, it's been around for a long time. Uh, Sync wall is a pretty cool one. It's like a graffiti wall, but it's shared. So, uh, yeah. And yeah, share data with the electronic chicken BBS. Log off. Recycle. Main. There's Sync wall. <laughs> so I guess um, this thing clears pr periodically, but this is from other BBSs, people typing stuff. So not listed here, but, but included is a external program called Bullshit. So that can uh, replace the bullseye bulletins. Um, I don't have it automatically installed because it's a little bit more involved. Uh, yeah, I have it disabled in the external setup module. Um, but if you read the instructions, you can set this up and it's light bar driven and you can have both a message base and individual files show up. It's a lot more featureful than uh, Bullseye, so check that out. Let's try Maze Race. So a lot of these programs require this JSON database service, so um, if you probably want to add it to the service. And then if you don't have the service already running and enabled, then you want to definitely install it or enable it. Multiplayer. Well, wow, it's only 10 years old. It's pretty new. Thanks, Matt. A lot of the menus have been updated. Not that that's a big deal, but mainly to accommodate 40 column displays like on uh, Commodores. So I did want to show you this uh, new option uh, that's disabled by default, but you might want to enable it. Uh, so under uh, SCFG Node 1 Advanced Options, uh, there's this notification user. Uh, in the um, error level, uh, basically a threshold uh, for which messages will be sent to whoever that notification user is. So by default, it's disabled to nobody. If you want, like the sysop traditionally user number one to be notified of errors, so any logged errors um, of this criticality or higher. So in this case, it's the critical. But if you lowered that to say like error, then any error message uh, would be emailed and sent to you as a telegram. Uh, so you get more immediate notification of um, any problems that occur with your system. And, um, or you can send it to a different user or just disable it. But uh, I wanted to point that out to you. And another thing, um, most sysops probably know this now, but uh, you don't actually need to set the settings for nodes 2, 3, th uh, two, three and 4 if they're part of the same instance of SBBS. And that's now clarified here in the help. So F1 brings up a help screen and it explains that uh, between the first node and last node parameters, they all share the first node's configuration. Um, it doesn't actually go and load another configuration for the second and etc. node. So uh, if you have multiple instances of Synchronet like I do, um, then uh, you'll that comes into account where you need to know what the first node is and use that configuration. But 
for most systems, just node one is all all you need to set your settings in. And then sort of related to that is now with a, a timed event, uh, you can set the log level, if it has any kind of error, what that error uh, level will be. And so if you want to increase that, say from the default, which be error to like critical or alert emergency, um, that will change the log level and then possibly trigger like that notification. So if you had that notification level set to critical, then you, and you had an event that you wanted to be notified, you want to be notified if it failed, then you would have to set that event to critical likewise. And then if this event for some reason fails, then um, it would log a critical message. And if that severity level is at least as high as that notification level that I showed you before under the node settings, then it would send an email, like I said. I hope that's clear. <laughs> Something else that is new under um, external programs, and this is true of uh, timed events and um, anywhere else you can configure an external program, and you have this option of a uh, use shell. Uh, that used to just say like use command shell, I think, and now it's use shell slash new context. So if this is a JavaScript module, which in this case Bullseye is, um, this would, if this was set to yes, it'll execute it in a new JavaScript runtime in context, uh, sort of isolating it from the rest of the system. So uh, this means that it doesn't benefit from any preloaded libraries or any, you know, values that are stuffed into objects that might be intended to share uh, information between modules. Uh, none of that's going to work um, if you have modules that depend on the behavior. But if likewise, if you have a, like an ill behave module that you've noticed when you execute it, like other things don't work after that, like there maybe there, it causes some kind of um, side effect problems, then you can kind of force it into its own little jail by uh, enabling this option and um, by default it's off so in case you have problems you probably want to leave it off uh, likewise under um, global hotkey events if you have a hotkey that you've defined um, and you got to be careful when you're doing this not to use like a common key like control h or backspace that would be bad uh, but if you have a uh, global hotkey and it, it's a javascript module it typically starts with question mark and that's also clarified now in the help here that uh, JavaScript modules usually begin with a question mark on the command line. A star also works, but uh, could it also be a Baja module. Anyway, if it's a JavaScript module here, um, I'm just not really, don't really have one, but uh, any global hotkey events that are JavaScript modules, they execute in the same runtime as each other, but nothing, but don't share that runtime with anything else. Uh, so this, I think, finally works. I don't think it worked in 3.17 um, or any previous versions. Uh, and so now you can have, you know, JavaScript um, global hotkey events, and if there are multiple of those, they all share the same runtime in context, but they don't conflict with any, or they don't share context with any any other JavaScript of the system. So, so now Synchronet is kind of a, a deeply nested layer of JavaScript, and you have you know scripts calling scripts and loading things and requiring other scripts, etc. And so um, sometimes you want to isolate from them from each other, and sometimes you do, do that out of necessity. And that's true of the global hotkey events, because they can be executed at any time. Um, we need to have them sort of execute in their own special context so they don't interfere with the JavaScript context that's already possibly running at the moment that someone hit a control key. So that's also new. So a lot of times when I know there's been a ton of changes since the last release, I don't bother creating a new features list because it just is too long and too time consuming to collate. Um, but I went ahead and did that in this case. Probably the biggest or, you know, impact feature was probably UTF-8 support. I already made a video uh, introducing and demonstrating that support. Uh, if your users are using SyncTerm or Netrunner or some other BBS client um, that's you know going to expect CP437 uh, characters, then no real advantage to you. Um, maybe a little bit if you're on uh, like international network message areas, FidoNet, Usenet, and you have uh, messages coming over that are UTF-8, then they'll automatically be translated to the proper character set for the user, uh, like Petski or, or um, CP437, or maybe just plain ASCII. When it, when it does benefit is like somebody's using, let's say, uh, Putty. And previously, that would might look like garbage, um, but with UTF-8 support, the default PuTTY settings, which uses UTF-8. Now, PuTTY looks great, default mode. Um, 
And uh, you'll actually get additional characters you can use. Um, like you get better check box here. So rather than being like the square root symbol, it's an actual check mark. Uh, so a few things look a little different, but uh, it should look mostly just like a, a you know regular BBS uh, ANSI graphics. Uh, UTF-8 here and um, auto detected shows it auto UTF-8. If you like overrode that, you say no, not UTF-8. ANSI, yeah, yeah. So now you can see that's what it would look like if um, we didn't detect UTF-8 and we're sending code page 437 characters to uh, the, an ex a terminal that's expecting UTF-8. So let's see if mouse works. Hey, mouse works in PuTTY too. And then real test here would be like external programs. So Minesweeper I expect to work. Um, but let's, what about like a traditional game like, I don't know, like let's say the Beast Domain. Auto install new programs. And this uses sockets. And it doesn't know anything about UTF 8. There, the Beast Domain. There. See, it looks usable. I don't like how the cursor appears in Putty, but not bad. Totally usable. usable. And this game doesn't know anything about UTF-8, so that's being translated through a pass-through socket. It converts from uh, code page 437. So this should work for most most programs. Most games should now work. Not that I recommend using PuTTY, um, but if that's what a user uses by default to connect to your system, then might as well support them. And they get the benefit of being able to um, like read international messages and stuff. So I, I demonstrated that in another video. How about, uh, we could do Lord. And then scroll back, looks pretty good. This teenage porn for you there. <laughs> and so it doesn't know the width of my terminal, does it? Let me see. Oh, it does. Yeah, look at that. So you can type super wide messages if you want. Yeah. Want to see what the answer screen looks like? It says 80 by 24. There, yeah, it's because I went into the user defaults, it redetected re the size of the screen. So, yeah, when you come out of this settings, it executes something called term setup. Term setup, yeah. And uh, one of the things it does is uh, redetect the number of screen lines using ANSI cursor position reporting. Uh, something else I wanted to show, and I don't need PuTTY to do it, was fast login support. So this is optional. Um, I think it's enabled by default. But if you just do exclamation before your name or user number, it'll skip all that login stuff. So yeah, a lot quicker. Oh, I guess, yeah, I should talk about this a little bit about raw TCP client connections. So um, some of the terminal programs um, designed to connect to, like, Commodore and Apple systems don't actually use Telnet because the gateways for those systems to TCP don't actually use Telnet either. So this feature automatically detects when a Telnet connection is not actually from a Telnet client, disables Telnet support. So that way things like file transfers will, will work. DOSBox uh, requires a special modem initialization command, ATNet1, to enable Telnet support. If you don't do that, then you get a raw TCP connection, for example. So you're using Telemate or Procom or Telex or something from uh, DOSBox. Um, now Synchronet automatically detects that you're connecting without actual Telnet support, and it won't try to do the special escaping necessary for uh, character 255. Oh yeah, okay, I should demonstrate these. So there's some new sysop commands that are helpful. And they do show up on the menu here. So echo and eval. Um, echo is useful, especially if you want to test like at codes. Like you want to see what would happen if you put an at code in a, in a file and you just want to experiment uh, without actually modifying a file and then displaying it every time you just, you know, test a single at code. Um, so like echo at bbs 
And it tells me the name of my BBS, for example. Uh, the eval executes a JavaScript expression. And so that's just kind of like a mini little program, a typically like one line, but um, you could do multiple um, actual expressions. So if you want to test something, or just look at like a property value, so like system.name, it's just the equivalent uh, in JavaScript. Um, but you could also do like a little program, you know. Example. Now, um, yeah, you can uh, upload message text using Zmodem. So if you're like an F FS editor in here and you just start an upload. I don't know how big that file is. It just puts it in the message body. And there, there's the, there's the uh, message text. And if you're using the internal editor, so this, this one, uh, it likewise will also recognize message uh, Z modem automatically. Um, or you can use the slash upload command and then it'll prompt you for the protocol so you don't have to use Z modem. Here's something. If you want to repeat the last sysop command, do semicolon bang and it just does the last thing you, you typed. So now we use up arrow and I can go back to the history of previously typed netmail addresses. So it's the same for uh, telegrams too. So if you send a telegram to somebody, it'll actually send it by default to the last person that sent you a telegram, but you can also scroll up and look at history of people you sent telegrams to. Uh, there's this export config module, which um, it's been a while since I even ran that thing. I think it has a lot of help. Yeah, so you can export all your configuration to a variety of text file formats like common delimited, JSON, etc. So that if you wanted to export that into some other, I don't know, database or something or another BBS program or whatever, um, you should have a lot of options there. The auto message is now a JavaScript module. Uh, it looks pretty much the same. One difference uh, is that when you read a message, it uses the quote uh, syntax. And the main reason for that is so it supports word wrapping very well. Also, sysops can delete with a D key. It doesn't appear on the menu here, but D will delete it. Um, there's some more spinning cursors. This is kind of a brand new feature, but I like this one. Um, I stole that from the Git Sizer program. But uh, there's actually 10 spinning cursors now. Most of them are just the old spinning cursors, but reverse direction. So like that's counterclockwise, that's right at you. Counterclockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise. And they're just they're randomly chosen, but there's 10 of them and you can conf you can customize those now in your text.dat file. It's the last few lines now. Yeah, the spinning cursors. So these are the spinning cursor sets. In this uh, backslash x method, that's just how you encode a CP437 character. Uh, without uh, having to actually put the literal character in there, use this C escape sequence. That's hexadecimal. Backslash X stands for hexadecimal. Oh, okay, this is a good one. The um, the QNet FTP module, which uh, was in Baja, uh, you see it here, the source, this has now been replaced by a JavaScript. So um, the, the Baja module is still there, just in case you had a problem with the JavaScript one, but the JavaScript one, if it, if it exists, takes precedence over the, the .bin file, which is a compiled version of the .src. Uh, but this now means that fewer and fewer uh, dependency on Baja exist, and uh, it can go away that much quicker. Okay, well, there's a find option now in UIFC programs. This is a UIFC program. UIFC stands for user interface. But... Um, if you have like a long list of file areas or something and you wanted to search and then if you have multiple things that match 
like programs and control G will repeat the search. So control F, control G. Sunrise doors are a lot, a lot easier to install now. There's a couple environment variables that make that much easier. Uh, they come from PC board. All right. I think that pretty much covers the, the main new features. There's some Petsky uh, improvements, um, ice colors, bright backgrounds. If you really want to use that stuff, you can. Yeah, some new control A codes for specifying bright background. Those are documented on the wiki. Attribute codes. Yeah, E, capital E. All right. So on to the next challenges, bigger and better things for version 3. whatever's next.